Yeah, the, the final point, and I really want to get to this because um, you spent a great deal of time talking about, well, there, there were several movements, two of them in particular, there was ACT UP, um, and there's some really interesting and important lessons that come from that movement, um, and also SPK, which, I don't know, I, I really want people just to read it because it's so well, like, as you describe in the book, it's like, this is the most comprehensive thing written about this group this um oh, movement it, it, it i mean it was mind-blowing i didn't know anything about spk i think i've seen you mention it before occasionally just maybe on death panel or uh, on social media or writings or something but like to get a comprehensive rundown of like what this group was what their aims were and what happened to them it was like holy shit like that was you know, there's a lot there. So I don't want to necessarily like take away from people wanting to read about it because it's so well written and detailed in the book. But um, I think maybe to frame it within this sort of maybe a lesson that I learned from that is that as you pose in the book is that this health communist um, movement towards health communism has to be international and that existing within the context like we're both in the United States the health capitalist model that is often, I mean, it's very much situated within the U.S. and it emanates outside of it. So it's a part of the empire. It's a part of colonialism. It imposes itself on other nations that have their own, you know, healthcare systems, welfare systems, um, and, you know, part of the dynamics of capitalism, of global capitalism and U.S. imperialism is to impose these dynamics, these, you know, health capitalist dynamics on these populations through a variety of means, right? Um, so I think what happens is like, we do often think in the frameworks of nations, like, oh man, Cuba's got it good. Right. Or, <laughs> or, you know, even like, you know, the national, uh, NHS in England in the UK is awesome. Right. Like Scandinavia has got a fucking awesome healthcare system. Why can't we have that? Or Canada, Canada is great too. Like we do this thing. Where we're constantly comparing, like, why can't we have that? Why can't we have that? And as you demonstrate in the book, it's like health capitalism is everywhere you know, I mean, there might be some holdouts to some degree, but nonetheless, it, it bleeds into every country. So capitalism is international, but a sort of true health communist movement has to be internationalist. And I think what's important is like maybe a responsibility that activists, uh, people in the U.S. have is to understand that if it transforms here, it would not necessarily automatically emanate outward to every other country, but because the U.S. is so central to imposing this kind of form of health regime or whatever on other countries, uh, healthcare regimes, um, it would have an effect. It would have an internationalist effect. That's kind of what I, at least I interpreted from reading health communism. Um, so in framing this discussion around these movements like ACT UP and SPK, I think what happened is, again, different lessons were drawn from each of these, but I think with SPK, it felt like it was incredibly, it was isolated within West Germany in a sense. Like, it became an international issue because they were framed as terrorists, <laughs> ultimately. Yes. But the lessons that we can learn from that are applicable anywhere in the world. I mean, so I'm sorry, this is a bit of a broad, huge, kind of almost like a meta question, but like having an internationalist movement, of you know, health communist movement, um, and maybe learning something about like these, like, like, uh, act up or SPK. Like if we could talk about that. Um, yeah, sorry. There's a lot of thought there to kind of work. No, with, no, but. no. I'm so glad you asked about this. I've been like waiting for someone to, <laughs> to ask about SPK yeah. or act up. But, um, a lot of the discussion is obviously focused on kind of like the first third of the book and this is the back third mm -hmm. of the book. So yeah. I get it, you know, yeah, um, yeah. and I have a tendency to be long winded. So that's also my bad, but no, no, you're, you're good. We we have two chapters about SPK, which is the Socialist Patients Collective out of Heidelberg, Germany. They're a group that formed in the 1970s. Um, they were very inspired by sort of existentialism and the anti-psychiatry movement, but also mm -hmm. a bunch of simultaneous movements that were going on globally at the time within institutions um, mm -hmm. like asylums or uh, like large scale state hospitals, because it's important to remember, you know, from our perspective now, 
I was born in 1990, the year the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I never have lived in an era of mass institutionalization, so to speak, but mass institutionalization um, was the default model of care for anyone that needed a little extra care for a very, very long time. I mean, it's, it's uh, really a kind of classic economy of scale argument. And so for a long time, people who were chronically ill, disabled, mad, mentally ill, whatever, um, oftentimes you found yourself uh, living in one of these large institutions for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And what starts happening in the 1950s is that a lot of the, the sort of conditions are getting more and more austere and there is a move away from this warehousing model of care that's largely led by professionals who are questioning the kind of carcerality of their own authority. And that's very important. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But what's equally important is the patient movements who are happening on the inside. Because while there was a sort of revolt of professionals that led to deinstitutionalization, there was also a revolt of patients inside who were organizing themselves. And SPK is one of... Um, probably maybe one of the better known incidences of this, even though the story of what happened to SPK that most people know is wrong. And so we tell a very different story of SPK in our book. If you read about SPK or you watch the SPK documentary that's been made, hmm. you will hear that SPK was a group of mental patients who organized and then became involved with the Red Army faction, who was a, you know, it's like the, ba the Bader Meinhof gang. Sure. Um, so they were mm -hmm. sort of lumped together in the press. And um, ultimately, uh, though we take them for their word and say that there wasn't actually involvement between the two groups beyond them having some brief contact, the way that they've been framed historically was that SPK was the recruitment arm mm -hmm. of the RAF and that the RAF, it was the crazy brigade where all the, you know, once all of the sort of members of RAF that were competent were killed by the state that they turned to SPK to kind of recruit anyone. And in, looking in, back is, on things. Oh, sorry, sorry I just want to say RAF was like, I don't know what to call them, that they were like, <laughs> they were bombing people, right? Like there was like things going on. I don't know if bombings are correct word, but like they were, there was like bank robberies and things like that going on. Am I, am I incorrect? Yeah, yeah, no, okay. there were definitely things that, um, there is, there are definitely things that like, uh, the RAF did that were more similar to like the, um, weather underground in the United right. States. Okay. Um, yeah, I but just wanted to, to yeah. just so people know, like, kind of Sorry. an idea of, like, what they were being associated with. That's that's all. That's I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. I would say, like, RAF is kind of thought of as not just, like, a very important terrorist movement because they were leftists, but also because they were coming from within West Germany at a time where this was mm. a project of proving that capitalism could win over communism. Right, and right. so they were a militant, uh, the RAF was a militant um, left movement at a time where Germany was reckoning with the failure of its denazification. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was a big program led by the United States where the U.S. military said, we're going to go through Germany, we're going to find all the Nazis, we're going to put them all on trial, we're going to make sure that they're pulled out of positions of power. But the problem was is that there were too many Nazis once they went through to try and do that. Mm -hmm. And so they left a bunch of Nazi doctors in particular mm -hmm. installed within hospitals. They left a lot of people within universities and in these positions. And the Nazi kind of ideology about there being types of people that, you know, then this was inspired by the U.S. And eugenics movement. Yeah. who were biologically inferior, was um, still pervasive and common even after this process of denazification that happened where the U.S. said, right. we got rid of them all, everybody in Germany now is totally nice and fine and it's all good to go, yeah. right? And so there's um, this kind of history, right, where you, you could say that, okay, well, at this moment you have these, like, radical left movements who are challenging the state who are calling everybody Nazis and isn't that so ridiculous and they bombed things. But like also 
they were right. The people that they were calling out were people who were involved in the Nazi regime, who mm -hmm. still held that ideology and taught it in universities. Mm -hmm. And what SPK did is they, um, they self-organized. They were doing some of their own therapy within the unit that they were in, which was a low-income um, mental health care clinic mm -hmm. that basically was a way of diverting the like lower income patients into um, the old institutional warehousing models and um, higher income patients got, you know, more compassionate one-on-one -on -one care in a nicer hospital facility. And so one of the doctors, um, Dr. Wolfgang Huber, who was working in this low income clinic, he started working with his patients who were politically inclined, who are inspired by, definitely inspired by people like the RAF who were organizing and not just them, but, you know, Weather Underground and all these other groups who, you know, were incorporating left politics and praxis with, you know, some really aggressive critique of the capitalist state. And mm -hmm. for, you know, I think the reasons of uh, inspiration uh, being in common, but also because we tend to think that people who are mentally ill are dangerous, mm -hmm. it was very quickly collapsed into one thing and mm -hmm. spk and raf became kind of mushed together and a lot of the ways that it's talked about um in again like 99.9 percent .9 of the accounts that will mention spk will mention that they were this recruitment arm of the raf and mm -hmm. the members of spk at the time said no we talked to them but like yeah. You are connecting us to the RAF because there is a law that basically allows you in Germany at this time to like arrest people and hold them without cause if you're if they're under suspicion of terrorism. Sure. And SPK's organizing was a huge challenge to one of the largest academic institutions in Germany, the University of Heidelberg, which was a foundation of the biopsychiatry movement. This is where Dr. Emil Kraepelin, like this is pre-World War I, you know, he's like putting together the difference between dementia praecox and, and manic depression. And he's putting together some of these original um, diagnostic categories of who has quote unquote schizophrenia and who mm -hmm. is depressed. And that mm -hmm. was kind of the original um, biopsychiatric uh, pathology distinction was like kind of like determining between those two things. And so in a lot of ways, he's the grandfather of the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical mm -hmm. Manual. And so the organizing that SPK was doing was happening within this institution where they had a long and storied history of, of psychiatric innovation and being a well-respected institution. And the patients were saying, well, they're divvying us up by income. They're treating us like we're disposable. And also the university is still full of Nazis. And there has been very little that has changed between the kind of old care and the new care. And for that, the university was not super happy. And so SPK was a group that actually formed as a result of the crackdown that happened. They had their therapy taken away. They had their medications ended, you know, mm. like stopped without consultation with their doctor they were denied access to their doctor they were denied access to the kind of organizing that they were doing within the hospital mm. and so they revolted and they occupied the hospital offices and it, this began a kind of two year long um very public discussion about you know what west germany would tolerate in terms of political yeah. dissent yeah and ultimately what spk was criminalized for was for their critique of capitalism and for their declaration that their care was not to make them better, but to make them better workers. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what they were being institutionalized for because of the time was for things like being gay mm -hmm. or being like an art student or, you know, kinds of things that I guess would fall under the umbrella of like what a, you know, <laughs> social conservative would call like antisocial behavior, mm -hmm. listening to like rock music. You know, these are the kinds of things where it's right. like, and we go through some of these statements that have been made about the doctor where they're like, other doctors are like, yeah, Huber, 
I don't trust him because he's got like a Trotsky beard and he wears a leather jacket and he lets his patients call him by his first name. Mm -hmm. So he should be fired and we should lock all these people up. And so Mm -hmm. it was really this kind of moment where you had patient organizing and there's a lot of history of, of harsh crackdown on patient organizing, but patient organizing mixed with a critique of capitalism in the manner that they did it essentially resulted in extremely aggressive state crackdown of SPK. Mm -hmm. Um, They were criminalized. They were labeled as terrorists. um, They were put on trial. Many of them uh, were arrested, uh, chased down for decades by the FBI, even though the West German government was like, please, we don't don't extradite them. We don't want them back here. Like even in the late 80s, the FBI was like, oh, we might have found someone who was a part of SPK once. Can we send them back to you so you can put them in jail? And by the time even West Germany had given up on chasing these people, the U.S. was still like, Mm -hmm. we got to get them. We got to make sure they don't get in our borders. I mean, there are statements made on the floor of Congress referencing SPK, but if you go and try and study disability studies and patient movements, you're never going to hear about SPK because they're terrorists, they sure. were labeled, you yeah, know, because yeah. they were criminalized. Yeah. And essentially, the, the reason why they were actually criminalized is because they dared to say that they wanted to study themselves and treat themselves. And they didn't want to be subject to psychiatric authority in a hospital run by Nazis who thought that they were all worthless, disposable forms of life. Yeah. And um, it was a brutal moment of of state repression. Um, I mean, the people who were arrested, who were members of SPK, were held in conditions that were designed to try and psychologically break them, like no lights uh, 24 hours a day, and then all lights 24 hours a day playing like American pop music, like the kinds of things that you hear about, like as, you know, things that were used uh, by the U.S. government to torture people during uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars or like in Guantanamo, you know, these kinds of like psychological torture techniques. They drugged people when they had the trial themselves. They brought the doctor in, um, Dr. Huber and his wife and one other defendant drugged and chained to um, gurneys, you know. So it was one of those things where it was a kind of brutal moment of state repression that when we look back at this movement, um, we look back at them as a cautionary tale of criminalization or people that maybe went a little too far or terrorism. And and very few people actually take SPK at their own word and look at some of the accounts of these accusations of terrorism and where they come from. And so that's yeah. really what we do in these last two chapters is we give the history that led to SPK we give the history of the Heidelberg Hospital and we talk about some of their ideas and their movement and we talk about why they were criminalized and how that criminalization went on to have this life within like anti-terrorism yeah. academia where mm-hmm. the situation, the crackdown on SPK has been used to pathologize all left movements as being incapable of being satisfied by demands or crazy Mm -hmm. or whatever. And so we try and use it as a moment both to look towards their ideology from a positive sense, because I think their critiques were incredibly salient. And for myself as someone who, when I became disabled, like they were a major source of inspiration for me to understand my own identity and the reasons why society was treating me like the way that it was, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it goes way beyond ableism into these deep seated frameworks of who is valuable and who is not under capitalism like we cannot separate ableism or sanism from capitalist economic valuation of life and that's really what SPK argued that if all of our care is oriented towards making us better more docile workers can we really call it therapeutic yeah is it really helpful and don't we deserve care that's you know to make us feel better, not just to make us, you know, more docile, more accepting of authority, more willing to put up with, you know, maybe conditions in the workplace, you know, in the context of COVID. And so one of the things I really wanted to show people, you know, uh, 
and why Artie and I wanted to spend so much time on SPK is that I think that the story of SPK can teach us so much about our COVID organizing, both in the way that our demands can be pathologized, in the ways that left movements are criminalized, in the ways that left thought is sort of discounted, mm. but also in their critique of what our care is for, why mm. our care is in the forms that it is in, you know, why is it so important in the United States that, that our, our left movements debated whether or not there was room for private insurance in Medicare for all for eight years, mm -hmm. basically? Mm -hmm. This was a huge debate. There are lots of leftists who do not agree with me when I say that there is no room for private insurance in our society, right? Like that's a controversial yeah. <laughs> thing to say, perhaps more controversial than the Declaration of Health Communism, ironically, you know, but yeah. these things we have to understand if we're ever going to move beyond the kind of organizing that we've done. And so much of this kind of thought that has interrogated capitalism from the lens of exactly who and why, you know, who, who our care is for and why it's only for certain people and not for others um, it's so important for COVID organizing, for building a left movement that can push beyond these kinds of frameworks. And also, I think it's important to understand these kinds of parallel histories of criminalization, because I don't think the criminalization of RAF or SPK would have happened without the criminalization of the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. And the same way that us saying like, oh, you know, Canada, if we could only have Canadian mm -hmm. Medicare, if we could only have the NHS... These are zero sum frameworks that pretend that like if we, you know, win reforms in the US that it doesn't affect the political will and the scope of reforms elsewhere. I'm not saying that the US needs to do some sort of healthcare model and then that's right and good and then distribute it to the rest of the world. That's the exact opposite of what I'm saying. Um what I'm saying is that we need to look to our comrades in other countries who are engaged in similar fights because we are all living under health capitalism and we are all living under COVID no matter what borders you are living under and mm -hmm. where you are a citizen or a taxpayer, like mm -hmm. we are all affected by this. And so we have to be thinking of things as not just as the effects of things, not just ending at our borders, but impacting the range and scope of policy that other people in other organizing capacities are going to be able to work with. So if we're not making these kinds of international connections, you know, and SBK had so many of these international connections early on when they got started. And as they were criminalized, it really scared people and all those mm -hmm. professionals who were rebelling, mm -hmm. they disappeared, you know, and, and they did not show up. And, you know, for the most part, the vast majority of the people who had been inspiring them, corresponding with them, encouraging them when SBK was criminalized, they were not there to support mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And we do talk a little bit about the people that that showed up and how there were delegations that were sent, you know, from the Italian metapsychiatry movement and Deleuze and Guattari, you know, even mm -hmm. though Deleuze would not leave France at that point, he travels to Germany mm -hmm. with Guattari to support them. All of those people are thrown out of the court trial and beaten up by the police and yeah. half of them are arrested. And so it's, it's one of these moments where you could imagine like, okay, well, what did ha what would have maybe happened? I know this is like a counterfactual and it's not productive to engage in counterfactuals, mm -hmm. but what would have happened if instead of just basically three people like Franco Basaglia and the people he worked with in, it in Italy and then the French delegation, mm -hmm. what if instead you had had broad support, all the people who've been corresponding with SPK and encouraging them early on, if you had had Artie Lang and David Cooper and Thomas Saz and all of the Americans that were involved in all of that work as well, like Aaron Easterling, you know, all these people who could have who could have followed through mm -hmm. on their solidarity and support. And they were too afraid. They were mm -hmm. too afraid of the association. They were too afraid of being criminalized themselves. And to losing Guattari at this point, they had already had the police come in and raid their own homes. Um, you know, this is this is I think it's really interesting that the people that did stand in solidarity with SPK were people who had also experienced repression and criminalization in their own countries. Right. Um, 
you know, Basaglia did as well. And the Italian metapsychiatry movement is really interesting. If you want to read more about it, highly recommend John Foote's work. He's awesome and he's done so much work on on that. But you know, it's it's important for us to think beyond our borders and boundaries because there's nothing that we can accomplish alone. All good things are done together and all good things are done in resistance to the kinds of forces that are much bigger in scale than the kinds of forces that we think of as being contained within one nation's sort of fight for liberation. These are things that can't be separated from each other in the same way that you can't separate out like the U.S. branch of uh, Pfizer and the European branch of Pfizer, right? Right. Like what happens in one relates to the other and we can't put things out in the world without them affecting other movements and fights. 